Hello, Comics Alternative fans. Before we start with the episode, we want to invite all of you to check out our Patreon campaign. That's right. Go to www.patreon.com slash comics alternative for more details. There you'll find more information about the campaign and the cool rewards levels we have. For as little as $1 a month, you can help us maintain good quality comics talk. And the more you contribute, the more perks you get. These include monthly podcast episodes exclusive to Patreon supporters, as well as the chance to help us choose which books we review on the show. So be sure to visit www.patreon.com slash comics alternative and become one of our proud podcast patrons. Yeah, and now on with the show. This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, back again with Craig Yo. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And we are happy to have back on the show Craig Yo. He has a couple of books that just came out, Milt Gross's New York and the first volume of Weird Love. But before we get to that interview, we want to let everyone know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you'll find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. All of the other publishers, you'll find that the discounts are 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find incredible specials. Now, sometimes those special discounts are at 45% off the cover price. Sometimes it's 50% off. But many times, the discounts are much more impressive than that. That's right. And this month, they have loads of bundles that you can take advantage of to get a deeper discount on multiple issues from the same publisher. Uh, than you would get if you bought those books individually. And this month they have three different bundles from from DC that range from 45 to 55 to 65 percent off. And they have their usual bundles from Valiant, Vertigo, and Dynamite, and so on. So you can check out those discounts at DCBService.com. That's right. Great, incredible specials this month and every month. Go to their website to find out what those specials are. That's dcbservice.com. They will gladly take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and let them know that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, uh, as always, we have a really fun time talking with Craig and it doesn't hurt that we're back on the topic of weird love, which we uh, talked with him, uh, not the last interview, but the interview before that, when, when the series first started. Yeah. Yeah. I always like talking to Craig. He's a blast. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go ahead and uh, give that a listen then. Yes. <laughs> And we're very pleased to have on the show once again the great, the unpredictable. Craig Yo, Craig, welcome to the Comics Alternative again. Oh, thank you. I, I think this is my fourth, uh, is appearance the right word for a podcast? Uh, uh, voice appearance. 
voice appearance. Yes, it'd be <laughs> fine. Great. Well, I'm thrilled to be here again. Fourth emanation. There you go. Emanation. <laughs> yeah, that, that, this sounds something spiritual going on there. <laughs> emanation. Yeah, I'm glad you thought, think it's spiritual. It sounds like a dirty word to me. <laughs> you, you, you've almost you've almost got a sub, so we'll just keep punching your card. Yeah. <laughs> that so, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, and you know, lately we've been having you on whenever a new book of yours comes out, and if we continue yeah. to do this, then you're going to be setting records left and right until I stop putting out books. Yeah, so stop. if you want to be on the podcast, hey, there's your incentive. Stop, stop me before I publish again. <laughs> Well, you know, it's always exciting to to get you on the show to talk about these new books. And, you know, I think we would like to start with uh, Milt Gross's New York. Okay. And if you could – because, you know, there's a lot of hoopla behind this. And if you could explain it to our listeners, because I'm sure that there are a number of uh, listeners out there of the podcast who may not know – First off, who Milt Gross is, and then second, what is the significance behind this find of yours, Milt Gross's New York? Well, Milt Gross was arguably the funniest guy in comics. I mean, he just did these hilarious uh, comic strips. Bef- uh, previous to that, he was involved with I- the animation, and I'm talking about the early rudimentary uh days of animation when you know it was just uh very uh you know uh silent with me with maybe a little music thrown on top and uh you know and he was involved in in the early days of new york animation which was which is very exciting so he was a pioneer in in animation he was a pioneer in comic strips he did he did uh almost like like a handful of, of comics uh, in the Sunday newspapers and the dailies too, that that were just brilliant and brilliantly funny, and uh, and and then he he was one of the first cartoonists to 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 get a contract to write uh, 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 real books uh, like illustrated uh, uh, novels. So he would with his wacky, wild, crazy. Uh, nutty cartoons. He would illustrate these these funny these funny uh, books, and they, they sold in the they must have sold in the millions altogether. And uh, they, they, they were he was a quite popular kind of guy. And then he he also uh, did a a, a very uh, groundbreaking graphic novel called He, he Done Her Wrong uh, that was actually kind of a satire of. Of like the old woodcut graphic novels by Lind Ward, and in uh, in and, and, and some coming out of Germany, and so but he did his own. Again, his 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 cartooning was very uh, nutty, and so he did his, his own nutty version of, of of a graphic novel. So this was like one of the first graphic novels, so it was very very important. But what's exciting about the book we just published? It's it's we call it a lost graphic novel because uh, I, I think they he and maybe another fellow teamed up to to put together this this, uh, this book to to sell primarily to people coming to New York for the nineteen thirty nine World's Fair. I, I think a lot of people wanted to sell hot dogs and. Uh, and uh, souven- all kinds of souvenirs and everything to to these folks. Uh, Milt and this publisher uh, fellow wanted to sell uh, Milt's graphic novel that that, that had a, a a long title that was actually kind of, kind of confused confusing. We've shortened it. The original title uh, was uh, "That's My Pop Goes Nuts for Fair: A Milk Gross Tour of New York." And so it was. It was bringing in both the the, the World's Fair and, and the, the the Grand City of, of New York City in, into this. So we shortened it to, uh, for today's uh, audience, who are much bigger hurry. You can't say all those words together. We just call it Milk Gross's New York. And uh, but this, th- they probably went bust. I so very few copies. Uh, uh, exist or in, in in collectors' hands uh, in in their safes down in their basements that uh, it's it's really quite impossible to find and uh, so I was able to score a copy 
a, a few years back and I always wanted to put it together as a, a nice hardback book. It was originally kind of a fragile paperback and, uh, and again, uh, very few copies survived. Uh, so, you know, that's what we've done. We brought out this book by Milk Gross, who was a pioneer in animation, comic strips, uh, and graphic novels, and, uh, you know, just a brilliantly funny man. And also in another area that kind of pioneered was was Jewish humor. I mean, most humor that was related to Jews before Milk Gross was – it was derogatory, and, and Milk Gross, uh, you know, one of the of the clan, uh, made gentle fun uh, uh, about his his fellow Jews, and in, in in his uh, as opposed to <laughs> Gentile fun. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, Whoa! <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, you know, so he, he was one of the first Jewish comedians, uh, beloved by his own people and, and people out, outside uh, the Jewish faith. So. Uh, you know, so he was quite a remarkable person. Yeah, and, I, and you uh, mentioned in your introduction, I believe, the fact that he, he uses the vernacular, which is something that you may not have heard or, or seen a lot. Uh, and in fact, some of the phrases that he came up with that became popular uh, were in, at least phonetically, uh, trying to represent the Jewish vernacular, the Yiddish. Yeah, yeah. I think he borrowed from Yiddish and, and from just the language and words that he would hear on the street gr- growing up in New York. I mean, he was a, a New York Jew. He he grew up uh, in, in Jewish neighborhoods and, uh, you know, was, was part of the whole scene. And so, like, and and that, that uh, you know, really became a part of his, his art, his comics, his, his work. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the Jewish humor and the Jewish language and and uh, catchphrases, and uh, and like you said, he, he he borrowed some of the catchphrases, and he coined his own. Uh, uh, he, it, uh, one of my favorite uh, ones I've used through the years since I first saw it, Robert Crumb using it on the first issue of Zap Comics, is "dis a system," and uh, you know, and then even the the the, the main two characters of of this gr- part graphic novel, half graphic, I I call it a half graphic novel. Uh, half cartoon collection and half uh, uh, travel guide, so it's, it's three halves all together. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, the main characters are Pop, which is kind of a, uh, uh, a a forerunner of Homer Simpson, and then his adoring son, who always uh, would see Pop do all these crazy antics, and uh, but was still uh, fiercely proud of him, and would always say, "That's my Pop." Uh, so he, you know, and, and so that phrase became popular, uh, in its day, that's my pop and is this a system? And, and then his, his most, his, my most favorite, uh, phrase that he, he coined was banana oil, which was a euphemism for, uh, B U L L S H I T. Am I, am I allowed to say that word on your Sure. Part? All right. Bullshit. Okay. Yeah. Hey, we've talked about spanking with you before, so why not bullshit? Oh yeah, that very good. Uh, so banana oil is a euphemism for bullshit. A banana oil you would use on a polite podcast. <laughs> bullshit you can use here, I guess, and talk about spanking or whatever. We'll get into that when we talk about our new uh, uh, book of romance comics. We'll get we'll get into another conversation <laughs> of spanking. But uh, this Mill Gross, my brand spanking new book. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to get back on topic here, and uh, it, I, I think it's a hoot. It's it's just a lot of fun. I mean, you can't not in you know have a big smile and and have a lot of guffaws as as, as you uh, read through it. It's just it, it's pretty hilarious. He, he was a funny, funny guy. And, and I and too many. Gra- I, I, I don't know. I don't know how many graphic novels today are are funny. You know, graphic novels grew up, I guess, and became quite serious, and many of them about about serious subjects. But there's few of them that are funny. It's certainly, probably none none that have ever been as funny as this one. Uh, more uh, funny funny cartoonists should tackle graphic novels. I think. I agree. I agree one hundred percent. I mean, I like the serious stuff too. I mean, but you know, we need to have the full spectrum. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned the original title, uh, which is kind of long, but it had "That's My Pop" in it. So, 
you know, as you were suggesting earlier, uh, readers of the day would have recognized that. So that phrase, that's my pop, would have been a marketing hook. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, Mill Gross was a household word, uh, word, uh, I mean, name, uh, y- you know, back back in the day that we keep referring to uh, comic strips, strippers, uh, cartoonists, comic strip cartoonists were, uh, you know, household names. They were revered and uh, and uh, loved and, and uh, uh, you know, everybody read the Sunday funnies and uh, you, little kids would crawl on the floor and read them, re- read them uh, on the carpet after the newsboy brought the, the, the Sunday newspaper and dad would read it and in bed and, uh, you know, before he running off to church or, or synagogue and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Sunday funnies were in the comic strips were a big part of people's lives. You know, there weren't so many entertainment options as there are now. Uh, so, uh, that's my pop was one of the, one, one that people had the most fondness for because it was, it was, it was just so hilarious and, and just wacky, wild. Uh, stuff. I mean, it's zany, and uh, I mean, the characters are in constant motion. They're cross-eyed and they're slipping on banana peels, and uh, just in, involved in all kinds of zany escapades. Uh, you know, it was, it's, it was just a, that's my pop was just a really fun strip. It, I, I interviewed uh, for my first book on Milk Rose. I did a, a big, thick book called uh, uh, "The Complete Milk Roses uh, Comic Book Store." comic books and life story and uh for that i worked closely with his son who's who has since passed but uh you know he he uh he, 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 he i think uh it was from him that milk got that that phrase that's my pop uh mm-hmm. you know he had used it and uh milk it, it was fun uh talking to his son because there's a few cartoonists that i've heard about or even met who their their creations are delightful and fun and 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 lovable but they themselves aren't necessarily uh like that like that so uh you know certainly there are fun cartoons but there's there's some that are real really really real asshats shall we say on the, on, <laughs> this, on this polite po- podcast today uh, so uh but mill he was a uh, a real mensch. He, he he really was a lovable guy and a great father from everything I heard. And and his his, his kids uh, just just adored him and his wife also. And uh, you know, so it uh, he he really made his person his own personality work uh, in, in the comic strip medium. Did you guys get a chance to read the book? What'd you think? Oh, cool. oh yeah. Oh, I loved it. In fact, um, one of the things I wanted to ask is, is there a particular section of Milk Gross's New York that you particularly like? Well, I, outside uh, of your introduction, of course. Well, that's probably the least. least <laughs> done, but uh, I love it all, but, you know, I. I was I, I was uh, I was kind of fascinated by the uh, the section on the on old New York because he come in there and, and and this may have been the first use of this he he actually used collage where he would take his zany drawings and and uh, marry them up with all old uh, engravings from like the Police Gazette and and <laughs> old historical engravings and things like that so I thought that was pretty fun I mean later on. People like Staranko, who wrote, uh, I'm quick to point out, wrote our wonderful introduction to the book. And uh, Jack Kirby and, and, and uh, even Mort Walker in, in comic strips, the, later on they used uh, collages but as, as part of their work. But I think Milt was maybe the first. This, this is the first instance that, that I, I know of it. So, that, you know, that's a very fun section. And uh uh, when he finally gets to the end, the, to the to the New York World's Fair, when when Pop and his son get get to the fair, I mean it gets pretty wild. Uh, and, and the fair itself was wild. And, you know, I did, did a lot of research on the on the fair in preparation for this book, and what a wild, zany, crazy uh, extravaganza the, the New York World's Fair was. It was like uh, 
I mean, you had the Salvador Dali exhibit and in a in a, a a a village that they created of midgets that people would uh, you know go and observe, and uh, they had a uh, uh, you know a parade of uh, what was it cows uh, throughout the the fair from one from each state, and it was just awkward. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of. They found a lot of excuses in the name of science and art to have topless women as, <laughs> as part of these, these exhibits. And uh, you know, it's just like it was like a, you know, a, 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 it's like Disney World on an X, or an R-rated Disney World on cocaine or something like that. It was just yeah, yeah. Disney was, on ecstasy. Yeah, Disney Disney on ecstasy. Uh, so. Uh, you know, so when Mill Gross then gets to the fair with his zaniness, you know, all, all uh, H-E double toothpicks, to a phrase I like to use on polite, polite podcasts, all H-E double toothpicks uh, breaks loose. So, you know, that that's certainly, I think, one of the great chapters, the great Indian chapters. But, you know, you get to see all of the old Big Apple, you know, the... The, the the entertainment of the of the Big Apple and uh, in, in the in in the chapter called After Dark in the Big City, you know the showgirls and the and the you know the 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 all night dancing and uh, and uh, and then you, you know there's a, a section where to dine in New York, which is which is pretty funny, and and then uh, you get to see all the cultural landmarks like. Uh, the New York Public Library, which I I, I used uh, the picture he did of the famous uh, that famous lo- uh, place uh, on, on the cover of our our new edition of the book because I've always I've always loved the two lions sitting before the great library there and uh, so it was fun to put put that right on the cover and in fact the the New York Public li- Library was pretty excited about that and had me. I'll come down and give the, a talk about the book. So that, that was kind of a dream come true to me because I love that library. So to, to be a, uh, asked to, to actually give a presentation about uh, the the New York great Jewish cartoonist, uh, Milk Gross, it just kind of all came together. Lots of fun. That that one, the New York Public Library one, is also, is also one of my favorites. But uh, in, in general, I'm just – fascinated throughout the book with the way the many ways in which pop tries to earn a nickel <laughs> <laughs> is there everything everything he does seems to be five five cents and except uh i think he does some boat rides for four cents or something like that yeah. um but but that that feels really like like gross was really tied into that depression era working class um world where you know everybody was trying to get by and so pop pop is the the kind of every man for that uh people going through that experience yeah you're right i mean i think that's people really related to pop i mean pop if the economy was good i think pop still would have wanted to you know come up with these shyster kind of (laughs) ways to People couldn't get work, but Pop, Pop probably didn't want work and was happy to just to try to fool people to give them their their hard-earned nickel. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Pop was a real he was a, he was a real scoundrel, you know. He was uh, kind of like uh, Billy DeBeck's Barney Google too, you know, except maybe even a little little nuttier. Uh, you know, he's always trying to connive people, and you know, he came up with. But we see, saw as very funny ideas, uh, you know, to, to 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 get to get some kind of a uh, way to separate people from their uh, thin dimes. <laughs> now, in, in the book, about three pages before the aforementioned old New York section, where he incorporates those old uh, images, the photographs, there is uh, the section around the clock with Pop, and I think you point this out. In your setup to this volume, and in, in that that these are a little, uh, um, you know, uh, off uh, off topic, but these are uh, individual, like one panel 
uh, comics that he would eventually go on or with plans to publish in newspapers? I think they may have, may had already been published in newspapers. I, okay. I get the idea that they came up with it. Like all of a sudden they realized that the fair was upon them and, and, and like pop, they might be able to sep- separate uh, some people from their, their spare change. Uh, so I, I think he and this may be public. This is my, what I've, Imagine that he and this publisher decided to like throw this book together. And, and Milk Gross, I mean, his stuff is brilliant. He was like a Zen master. So, but the stuff, uh, it's it's hard to describe. I don't want to say it, his artwork looks hurried because it doesn't. It's not amateurish, and everything is is uh, spot on, funny, and and he captures just the right you know crazy feeling in in each and every drawing and each expression on every face, but. On the other hand, I, 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 I think if he slowed down too much, it would, it would, his artwork would appeal, uh, appear labored. So I, th- I think he, he worked very fast. And, and then I think for this book, he probably worked especially fast, kind of just pulling all kinds of things, uh, you know, out of his brain and throwing them on paper. And it, it, you, you just get caught up in the, in the, the life and the, the excitement, uh, you know, through his drawings. And, and I think part of that was that he realized, Oh gee, I got to fill out a few more pages. So it was like, he grabbed some old proof sheets from his comic strip and, you know, <laughs> grabbed a pot of glue and, and la- lathered up the backs and pasted them down on the, on some boards. And he, the, 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 the novel, just the graphic novel or the book or the, this, this comic book, uh, uh, exploration just, it, it, you know, it, it just looks like it, it, I, I, I may have mentioned in my introduction, it almost feels like punk, you know what I mean? A very, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's a garage band, uh, uh, of, approach to doing cartooning and it really works. It's, it, it makes it a lot of fun. So I think, the, I think those pages that you're referring to, like, are, are probably just, uh, proof sheets from some of the comic strips. Uh, you know that he had laying around that he kind of pasted in to to fill up those particular pages. Yeah, the art the art in those does look um, more detailed. The the shading is different and so on. Well, I actually think, than it, than it does had, in the rest of the book. So he had he had an assistant named Bob Dunn, uh, who who I met once in his home. He was an interesting character himself. He adored Milk Rose. And I think he, I think uh, uh, he pointed out to me that some of those some of those pages were actually comics comics that he assisted uh, Milt on, or maybe even ghosted a few by himself when Milt was uh, uh, on vacation or something like that. So I think I think a couple of those of the of the comic strips that uh, the panel cartoons that they grabbed and pasted in the book. I think maybe a couple of those were uh, Bob Dunn's, and that, that's why they, they look a little different. Bob Dunn himself was a very funny guy, and uh, he was a very funny uh, after-dinner speaker and uh, funny cartoonist, and the inventor of the knock-knock joke. Uh, he uh, used to answer the phone uh, uh, as just an office boy on Wall Street, and uh, to amuse himself, uh, uh, when people would call in, he, he would answer knock knock, uh, and they would say who's there, and then he would start this whole whole thing, and that's how he he put together the the original knock knock jokes, and he actually did a a book of knock knock jokes and popularized the whole uh, form. So he he too was a clever guy, but I think it's, it, there's times that I can see a little bit of his assistant on some, some of these things uh, in, in this book. So uh, that's that's said and done. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> when, when I read that in your introduction about Dunn inventing the knock knock joke, that kind of floored me because that that's one of those things I never thought was invented. Invented, yeah. right? Like that, that it just kind of was a thing that maybe you know, uh, you know, early Neanderthals started <laughs> and just evolved with human communication. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a byproduct of the discovery of fire, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. Except their knock knock jokes were probably hitting each over hitting each over each other over the head with a club, I think. Yeah. That, that was a knock knock joke. 
Now, uh, your new book, and, and for listeners who have not seen this, let's say online or in a, in, in a bookstore, because it's out now, um, it's 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 a beautiful tome as all of your books are. A lot of attention goes into the design, and so this is a nice hardback. And you've made the cover look very old and worn. There's the, uh, you know, the as you mentioned earlier, that New York Public Library image on the front. But then everything around it uh, looks a little tattered and stained. You know, even the very back with the uh, uh, the ISBN and, and the barcode, which again you do something clever. You have pop on top of the Empire State Building and, of course, all the buildings in New York, the barcode. So uh, so I, it, it, it looks really good. Now, this is the only other publication of this manuscript outside of its original? Oh, yeah, I know. It's never been reprinted. Wow. And like I said, there's only a few copies. A couple, couple of collectors have them and a couple of institutions have them buried in their archives. So, uh, you know, it's it, I'm very proud that, you know, we were able to bring this important book back out for audiences and I, I don't think that many people saw them during the depression I don't think it got distributed much or out there much well, is, <laughs> with this being such a rare uh, book I mean how did you chance upon your copy well actually I, 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 I've known about its, its existence for a long while and I just uh, since the day uh, eBay started I, I started looking for this and it took, took a uh, a, a number of years till I finally some guy, guy put one up and I I grabbed it quick. So uh, good old. That's why uh, God invented eBay so that I I could find books like this. Hmm. Speaking of inventions, did you know God invented eBay? <laughs> Not the knock knock joke though. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. That that, that was Bob Dunn. You're. Comp- <laughs> God with Bob Dunn. Milk Gross is close to being a god, maybe. But <laughs> now another uh, book that Milk Gross uh, published, and and actually ha- it has seen different reprintings. And, and in the latest one is from Fantagraphics. He done her wrong. The great American novel with no words. And you wrote the introduction to that. Yeah. And right. you pointed mm-hmm. out in that introduction that in an earlier, I guess, Dover uh, edition of He Done Her Wrong, that it wasn't exactly the complete manuscript, that they had abridged it uh, because of certain racial representations. Right. Yeah, that's kind of – it's interesting how that came up about because I proposed to Fana Gra- – one day I was doing some books for Fana Graphics uh, and enjoying that very much and uh uh I, and i proposed to them like hey you know you should reprint he, he uh he done her wrong and they said well, lo and behold they 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 already got that un- underway and uh <laughs> would i like to write the introduction i said sure and so it just seemed like it was all coming together and then i just happened to mention them like well what uh what edition are you reprinting and they mentioned I think that they were reprinting the Dover edition. I said, well, oh, well, maybe you should think about that because the Dover had uh, taken out pages with, with uh, what we now realize are, are kind of uh, unflattering racial stereotypes. And, you know, I mean, as a historian and as a publisher uh, and, and any thinking sensitive person, you, you pause to think like, you know, how do you, ha- how do you handle this? Kind of material do you for historical reasons do you do you print it and I mean for many years uh Disney didn't re-release uh early Mickey Mouse cartoons because they there's racial mm-hmm. stereotypes in them and and uh same, same with the Warner Brothers and yes. but but finally they brought those out again and they they have uh somebody like Leonard Moulton you know gives gives a little talk at the end how you know this was particular to its time and people uh, you know, didn't realize or cognizant of, you know, h- how uh, disrespectful and hurtful and uh, prejudiced these kind of drawings were, you know, that they, they they thought they were somewhat in good fun. Uh, you know, now we're more enla- enlightened, thank goodness. So, you know, so when I, so uh, Fanographics did decide for historical purposes to, 
they, they uh, borrowed my original copy of uh, He Done Her Wrong, and they decide for historical person uh, reasons to, uh, you know, use it in uncensored, uh, so to speak. And 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 with this latest uh, book, um, Milk Roses New York, there's. There's a few instances like that in this book too, and so you know we do at the at the, at the beginning, you know, warn people that you know these are in here. Right? Uh, there may be, uh, you know, so you know, t- times change. It's interesting. I mean, it's interesting though that that Gross was sensitive to the to the you know uh, defamation of Jews, so to speak, and 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 was a pioneer in in bringing more respect uh uh to them uh but he kind of missed it with 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 uh a- african americans so uh uh you know so if you there's not a lot but there you know when you see you know you do kind of gasp because uh you know they, they, they you know they 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 there really are these drawings where he does picture something like that they really are very stereotypical and wouldn't be accepted by today's standards. Yeah. yeah. In fact, the the uh, part that you're referencing in Milk Gross's New York comes fairly early. This is when he's going around. Pop and his son are going around in different parts of the city, and they're in Harlem. And so Pop is dancing along with several uh, African American kids who are doing uh, a dance on, on the sidewalk. But facing that page is Pop in Chinatown. And curiously enough, even mm-hmm. though he does draw the Chinese characters to where they look like they have kind of tilting and slanting eyes, the the visual stereotype is just not as egregious as what he does with Pop's visit to Harlem. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe like Chinese food better than soul food or something. <laughs> But you're right. You're right. You uh, know, there's yeah. Well, one is a little less uh, offensive than the other. I, it, I think it, it, I, it's 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 it, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I you know, looking back on the history of cartoons, mm-hmm. uh, I, I mean, this was cartoonist stock and trade uh, in the early part of the century and continuing into the. To, uh, into the, the like th- this book was originally printed in 1939 for the World's Fair, so it, you know these stereotypes continued up until that period and, and beyond. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think I think the the really ag- super exaggerated Asian uh, stereotypes didn't really happen until uh, World War II uh, from the pens of cartoonists. Then then it got even more. Uh, exaggerated and offensive so uh i i think uh certainly african americans uh were were badly represented in early cartoons and then irish the irish and 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 the jews themselves uh took a real beating too but it seems like the chinese uh wasn't as quite uh out there as much until uh, you know they were an enemy during World War II. Well, they, they were certainly caricatured in political cartoons quite a bit in the ni- in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. But um, there's the the comics historian Ian Gordon. I don't know Derek if you're ready in Gordon's comic strips and consumer culture mm-hmm. or uh, he, but he he, he draws ta- com- Ian draws comics. No, no, no. He's a historian of comics. Right. Do you know Ian Gordon? Uh, a- actually, I mean, speaking of Asia, I, th- I think I had lunch with him in Hong Kong when he lived over there. Yes, and yeah, I have- that would have, that would be Ian. So uh, he, he writes I, about I how the I am I haven't seen him here since though. He, he writes in in comic strips and consumer culture about how the earliest comic strips, because they were so localized to New York City, did deal with ethnic humor quite a bit and oh, then yeah. when when um, you know newspapers became more nationalized a lot of the the kind of you know italian ethnic stereotypes or irish and so on were not as in you know well known or as interesting in the uh 
in the Midwest and so on, but the ones that stuck around were the the Asian and the African American stereotypes. Yeah. Well, you know what? The ones that stuck around the, maybe the longest is the, is the Italian. I, people still <laughs> make fun of Italians <laughs> in in comics, and uh, it's more of a gentle, but I'm sure that some Italian Americans find it offensive. I mean, I'm I'm married to an Italian, <laughs> so uh, I don't. She, I don't think she appreciates the Italian stereotypes in, in comics and cartoons, mm-hmm. but but it isn't as as harsh. It, it uh, I don't think to. I mean, I should probably let her speak to that, but I don't think it's quite as harsh as to as the cartoons about African Americans that in the turn of the century or and, and again uh it's in mill did a lot to change the perception of of jews in in cartoons and and, and made people more affectionate towards them rather than uh right. harsh, harshly making fun of them that i mean they were they were pretty maligned too in in, in early comics that's for sure yes. I, there, there was a cartoonist named zim which i think is one of the most brilliant cartoonists uh, in in the history of American cartooning, uh, and, and, and a game changer in that he was he was the first one to take. Speaking of old engravings, uh, early cartoons looked like old engravings. They were very stiff and all kinds of cross hashing, kind of labored over, and and he was the first uh, one to kind of pave way for the eventual zany guys like Milk Gross because he he, mm-hmm. he had a much more loose, fun style, but he. Uh, I mean, you you could you couldn't print a book of collection of his work that that didn't offend somebody on every page because his whole mm-hmm. stock and trade was was ethnic humor, and so he made fun of the the Asians and the blacks and the Jews and and his, and his own uh, ethnic background, the the, the Irish. Uh, so uh, you know, I mean, and I don't think he he, he thought I don't think he thought of it though. I I did. In my book, comics about cartoonists, I use one of his drawings as a frontispiece, where all these uh, r- racial and religious stereotypes are, uh, as he sleeps, are attacking him in in his nightmare. You know, mm-hmm. getting, getting back at him. So I guess he was a little cognizant of. Yeah, and in, in, in fact, comics about cartoonists was your, so to speak, first introduction on the Comics Alternative because we reviewed that in the very early days of the podcast. Ah, okay, yeah, that's right. Very good. And I was kind of reluctant to put that Zim drawing in there, but he was so brilliant, and I think he does need to be represented and and not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Uh, But again, his stock and trade was was ethnic humor, which I don't think think he – I actually – you know, it's hard to. You know, I hope I'm not defending the wrong thing, but I, I doubt that Zim had a mean bone in his body. But that was just, uh, you know, that that's 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 what people made fun of. You know, and, and thankfully that that has passed. You know, I mean, I was trying to explain to my Italian wife the other day about Polish jokes. She saw one on Facebook or something <laughs> like that, or something. And I was trying to explain to her how. You know, these were popular. I think in the seven, so popular in the seventies, and and so offensive, and and thankfully, you know, gone now. But uh, uh, well, well, growing fact, up in a Polish family in the seven in the seventies, we uh, we had our share of Polish jokes <laughs> around the around the dinner table all the time. <laughs> but thankfully, now our country is free, totally free of racial prejudice and. <laughs> that's right, because we're in a post-racial era. Yeah, that's right. No, it's geez, it's it's horrible. But thankfully, at least other people are are you know not not doing the right thing. But thankfully, at least cartoonists uh, are are off the hook this time. That, that you don't see too many racial or stereotypes or making fun of Jews or something. One of the things I appreciated when I moved from New Jersey to North Dakota was how uh, the Polish jokes became Norwegian jokes, oh. and, and it was the exact same joke. Just. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I, like I said, I, people are still uh, poking fun of uh, Italians. You still see, uh, you know, 
cartoons, animated cartoons on TV or something like where they're all of a sudden kind of have a Italian stereotype. But uh, there you go. Also um, coming out, I guess, on the heels of uh, Milt Gross's New York is the first co- hardcover collection of the uh, of the Weird Love reprints of romance comics and and Craig we had you on when this when this series started so how is uh how is weird love going <laughs> my personal weird love or you mean <laughs> how's yes. that going or or uh, that's, Craig Yo that, after hours that that's a straight line that's uh, <laughs> the comic book has just been a heck of a lot of fun to do i mean i just enjoy finding these stories so much and putting together the comic and it, it just, uh, I'm just having a blast doing it and stuff people have never seen before. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I, and it's been quite popular. Pe- people love it. And, and, uh, we've got a lot of great press on it and, you know, garnered a lot of fans for it and, and, and fans from, from every, every stripe. I mean, there's, you know, you know, I do this, we do this series called haunted horror which is mm-hmm. reprinting old horror pre-code horror comics from the 1950s, and uh, we're and, and we build up quite an audience for that. And and I'm finding a lot of a lot of the people who pick up haunted horror have transitioned into the weird love uh, comic uh, series we're doing too, because it's some of the uh, same artists, some of the same publishers, and uh, and some of the same writers. Uh, yet they're tackling a, a totally different su- subject, uh, the subject of, of romance and love. And uh, But we're finding the particularly wonky, bizarro, uh, deranged stories. Uh, so the, the horror fans <laughs> will like this. So I think that they're, they're a big part of our supporters. And, uh, and, and then women, uh, I, I'm surprised... Uh, even feminists are, have embraced the Weird Love comic series. That they, they find it a uh, fascinating read, and and uh, like a uh, you know a, a warning, like we can't go back to that. We 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 still have more progress to make in the in, in uh, sexual relations and 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 how how we treat people of both sexes, but and perceive them, but. Uh, when you read these comic books, you realize we've come a long way. And so they, they feel good about that. And the stories are just so off the wall. So beyond the pale that n- nobody can take them uh, too seriously. So, uh, do, do feminists have a sense of humor? They have, it's, it, I'm, I'm sure they do. And, and it's certainly proven by the way they, that they they, they love to laugh at the, the weird love comic books. You, you mentioned earlier there in the um, about the artists overlapping between the horror comics and the romance comics and the same same publishers and so on and that that just reminded me of the one of the if we could dive into the book one of the stories one of my favorite stories in the collection was um, uh, Weep Clown Weep Oh my God with, Oh with, this came sorry. up early. <laughs> with our well, you know, I, I'm sure Derek was hoping it was about Jerry Lewis and the Holocaust, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but the Mar- Mark Swayze, who is such a great artist, Fawcett artist from that era, did such great work on on Mary Marvel and Captain Marvel Junior. and so on. Uh, really knocked that story out. Yeah, it, it's a really he knocked it out of the park. It's it's a really w- wonderful story, and and I didn't I didn't think about. I mean, I knew it was going to be good wacky fodder for the for the book, but I didn't realize until we first published that story how much people were going to like that. There seems <laughs> a lot. And there seems to be a whole. That, that was one of the people's strongest reactions was uh, was that story, and they they dem- have demanded more. And I've been able to find a few more about clown love. People love stories <laughs> about clown love. <laughs> we're oh boy, into we're a whole getting, weird area. It is a we, weird area. We are going to get retweeted by uh, I don't know clown clown love ninety nine. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right. I, I was seriously thinking that maybe the subtitle for this episode would be "That's my pop," but now I'm I'm leaning toward clown love. 
got clown love will, will garnish more uh, uh, listeners. Let me tell you that people really responded to our, to that and our other stories of featuring clown love. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think uh, that completely takes the wind out of what I was going to bring up, and that is the, oh, no. the bit on <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Oh, yeah. that, that is a great one. Spe- speaking of clown love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the one issue that we first – the floppy comic book that we first put that story in there, I, I like the headline at the top I came up with, Sex, Drugs, and Ronald Reagan. Uh, <laughs> And you know, and who knew that Ronald Reagan would be a protagonist in a a, a romance comic book? I mean, it's it's a it's a one pager, but that one pager sp- sp- spoke volumes uh, to just the, to see Ronald Reagan as a uh, as the beau of the month uh, from an old romance comic book. It's, it was it was pretty pretty hilarious. Yeah, which is more unbelievable, uh, the fact that he would be a character in this one pager, or the fact that he would become president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, uh, our nation had us a a, a, a a bit of clown love, I guess. Exactly. There you go. And there was a lot of weeping in the eighties. Uh, and there was weeping in Nation of Deep. <laughs> yeah, no, this book has Ronald Reagan and it's, it's got clown love and it's got in, in commies. We we let off the first comic book in the, in, the, in this book again with the. Uh, uh, I, the story I fell for a, a, a commie, right? right. So, and there were there, this was maybe the best, but there were quite a in the old romance comic books. There was quite a few romance comic books uh, that featured stories with with commies in them, and it, it, was, it was a hot topic of the time. And uh, uh, you 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 had other comic books like spy comic books where they were fighting the comic commies and superhero where they were fighting the commies uh but in the romance comic books the the girls unfortunately were falling for commies uh of course it, it, there's a wonderful twist ending to the to this whole story that will will you know we won't be have a spoiler here uh but uh uh all things uh as, as you read about the red all, all things are not as they seem <laughs> But it's a stern warning about girls, and, and to this to to this day, we you know girls shouldn't fall for commies, right? Yeah, and, and apparently they shouldn't fall for hippies either, according to oh, well, love, love I, honor, and swing, baby. Yeah. <laughs> commies and hippies are kind of one one the, the same thing, anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this, the, the, our reprints start in the fifties, but we go in, in on into the sixties and seventies where. Comics were kind of trying to get relevant, so there's a lot of stories about girls falling for hippies, and and uh, but the writers and artists of the time were were mostly white, old white men in the in squares, uh, <laughs> or, or corners, and the girls uh, fell for the hippies, but they would always uh, end up going back to their original boyfriend with the with a suit and tie, uh, or. The hippie their, would stop their, being a hippie, right? Boyfriend in their high school that, that was in their high school class with a suit and a tie. Mm-hmm. Now um, you're, you're talking about the the oh. hippie stories. Um, now you've been doing this for, I guess you've been collecting these comics with the Weird Love series in mind for for over a year now, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So as going through everything, how difficult is it to find? A uh, story from, let's say, the late '60s or 1970s in a romance comic that you think is offbeat enough to include in the Weird Love series, especially compared to what we have, let's say, in the '50s and '60s. Oh, I, I think it. Uh, in some ways, I think it was get, they were getting weirder. I mean, I mean, we, I, I don't know if they were. Well, I don't know if they were weirder, but there were there was more plant. Uh, because certainly we found some really weird stories from the fifties, but I think the weird stories were more plentiful in the sixties and seventies, especially from Charlton, which is kind of the, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, s- low class, low rent publisher out of Derby, Connecticut. You know, there's DC and Marvel, you know, putting out you know pretty pretty first rate stuff, but there's Charlton that was just throwing anything into their books and, and letting the writers and artists get away with anything. And, and I think, uh, Joe Gill and some of the other writers there, uh, 
they would just do wacky stuff. And I think Joe Gill was interested in, I, I think he was interested, you know, reading and having read enough of his stories. I think he was interested in things like personally, maybe interested in things like spanking and, <laughs> and swinging and taming of the brute. Yeah. 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 And just, just all kinds of like, I, I mean, I think on one hand as a, as a conservative guy, and I believe, you know, having he served in the military, so he was kind of a conservative guy. You know, on the other hand, he was like, I mean, even even right wing, uh, uh, right wing conservative guys weren't above uh, maybe uh, saying "hmm, not bad" when they saw a, a brawless hippie chick walk down the street. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> You kind of had a, a love hate relationship that kind of came out in Joe Gill's scripts. I think he hated the hippies, yet he was kind of intrigued by their as as a writer, artist, dirty old man. He was kind of intrigued by their lifestyle at the same time. Mm-hmm. So you, I, I, I think uh, Charlton came up with a lot of wacky stories, and they're they're kind of hard to find. All those old Charlton romance comic books, what to get? They put out so many. While Marvel and DC were con- had pretty much abandoned romance comic books, except for a couple titles. Uh, uh, Charlton was in, in favor of superheroes. Charlton was putting out a slew of romance comics, and they had they must have had a dozen titles. And, uh, yeah. you know, so there's so many stories still to be found in the, in the old Charlton's. I don't, I don't know if this is a normal kind of collector's experience, but the times that I have found Charlton romance comic back issues, I found them kind of in bulk. Uh-huh. Like a, a comic book store will say, you know, somebody brought these in yeah and they'll have a long box full of and it'll be only Charlton romance comics yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh well i, I and, hope I find one of those boxes soon i i love them they're they're very wacky well i think my local shops or that now don't exist anymore but my local shop owner used to know used to have me pegged it's like yeah. we we got some weird stuff in do you want to take a look <laughs> right. i'm saving it for you well, it's amazing. Another thing about the Charlton romance comics is, you know, where, where Stan Lee was, uh, you know, having trouble with the Comics Code Authority and because he wanted to pu- publish an anti-drug story, mm-hmm. uh, and so he had to abandon the uh, the Comics Code seal for for one of his monthly issues when he when he wanted to do that. Which was, I think, the first crack in the in the in the in the code where you know eventually it, it unraveled the whole thing and, and it took it still took many many years but I think that was the first time w- where the code was really challenged and the, and, and the publishers realized hey we, we can publish comics without the code and people aren't going to be up in arms again like they were in the fifties you know uh, but Charlton on the you know. Uh, up in Connecticut was publishing all these romance comics with stories about swinging and, and a lot of near nudity. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, there was never, uh, naughty bits exactly shown, but it, it would come awfully close. And there was, so there, and there was swinging, there was near nudity. There was a lot of stories about drugs and for some reason, I they seem to be getting a pass from the comics code, who at the same time were, were really uh, being very strict with Marvel and DC. So I don't quite know what was going on there. Whether it was the, uh, uh, you know, just somebody is paying somebody off, or they just didn't take <laughs> Charlton seriously, or they are they somehow they thought like, well. Romance comic books are for older readers, not for young kids, and so we're going to be more liberal in our attitudes towards this and, and have less censorship. I don't know, but Charlton was getting away with some 
pretty wacky stuff. I don't know quite all the reasons, but yeah, because yeah, I, I was wondering about that. that you know, it might it be because they just didn't take Charlton as seriously, and they they thought, okay, well, they put out a lot of schlock anyhow. So yeah. you know, why pay attention to those guys because no one else may? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something, there was something different happening. Well, weren't the the owners behind Charlton kind of shady anyway? Well, the the the, the two owners uh, met in jail, so that that would, um, <laughs> <laughs> that might give you a clue. Yeah, I, I've always heard when we were talking about Joe Gill hey, earlier. I think it was uh, Dick joking. Jordana. What? I wasn't joking about that, by the way. That's, no, that's, I know, I know. That's, <laughs> true, that's the true origins of the of the t- two publishers that came together to publish Charlton Comics. Is is they they met in jail and cooked up their publishing plans. Um, um uh, if, just before Dick Giordano died, I, he did a panel at Heroes Con, which we've been talking about off the air. Uh, Heroes Con where it was a panel on Charlton Comics and about his time working there. And I think he mentioned about uh, Joe Gill in particular, that, that Joe Gill would ac- actually often kind of lose lose his paycheck uh, in a card game and have to go kind of crank out, you know, dozens and dozens of stories uh, in order in order to make up for that every every week or so. I think he's kind of a hard living guy. He was he was friend long lifelong friends. I think with Mickey Spillane. And, uh. and he was like a gun collector. And, you know, he was a, a really interesting character. But I uh, and he but and he could do he could do it all. He did, he did romance. He did funny animals. He did licensed stuff and yep. Gorgo to the Flintstones and well, of course, maybe Gorgo and the Flintstones aren't totally. <laughs> yeah. Gorko's kind of a dinosaur. So, uh, uh, you know, so he was a fascinating character. And, and uh, he did crank out those scripts, but a lot of them were a lot of fun and, and w- well but hurriedly written, maybe. And, uh, you know, I had interesting concepts and angles. And and I think he, some of the most fun he had seemed to be the, the romance comics. He was, he was, he would really come up with some nutty stuff. I think he was... Uh, he and, and, and an artist he often got teamed up with at Charlton, Ditko, were, I think they often maybe sometimes just kind of get bored and they didn't want to do the standard thing <laughs> to amuse themselves as much as it was to amuse the readers. They would just come up with wacky, weird, wild, wonderful stuff. And, uh, and in fact, Ditko even did a few romance stories. They, they were kind of, they were kind of straight laced. They don't quite fit into the, uh, weird love category, but. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that I, th- I think that the writer Joe Gill was having a lot of fun with these stories. So, yeah. you know, one one of my favorites in the collection, and and part of the reason is because you use a scene from it, the last panel, as at least the end papers in in, in the front of the book, uh, and that is the story, beautiful one. Oh yeah, and you know within the okay. So if someone gets weird love in their first volume, you know you want it. And by the way, who shouldn't get this book, right? Because you know yeah. not only great stories as we've been discussing, but you know as I mentioned with uh, the Milt Gross book, you know a very nice hardbound uh, hardbound edition, and um, just just really beautiful. But when they open it, they will see. The, uh, in the end papers, <laughs> this uh, ugly looking woman looking at what appears to be a very handsome man. So it seems funny. And then you but you get to the story, beautiful one, and you know, I can't remember the the title of it, but it reminds me of that classic Star uh, Twilight Zone episode um w- that uh, Donna Douglas is in. You remember what I'm talking uh, which one I'm referring to and she is uh, you know cuz she's beautiful and they're wanting to do an operation on her because she feels that she's not beautiful, and the the turning point at the very end of that episode is the fact that this society's idea of beauty is what we would consider ugly. Do you, you know which Twilight Zone I'm referring to? Uh, I don't, but I I, I I I I get the idea of the story. That's that's cool. 
Uh, but do, do you know which one I'm talking about, Andy? I don't know if you're. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, so, but it, it reminded me of that because you get this twist at the very end of Beautiful One, and, and this is—it's not so much weird as it, it, it's got a very empowering message. Yeah, it's empowering, and it's it's kind of sweet. I mean, it's funny. I mean, a lot of these stories were were played pretty straight. I think when they when they were first done, but. We can laugh at them now, but there's there's some of these stories that you're laughing like this story. You're laughing in, in some sense, but then it also it's a very sweet story and an affirming story and and romantic story. Gosh darn it! Yeah, you know it's 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 kind of romantic, and that's what I like about the romance comic books. They are very the stories that they are very human. I mean, they're not superheroes, guys flying around in you know. Uh, in their long underwear or fu- talking funny animals or something like that. You know, I mean, which, uh, hey, I love all those kind of comics, but, you know, it's it's kind of nice to read a romance comic book where the characters are, are purportedly r- real humans, you know, and the men and women and trying to figure out their lives and their, 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 uh, love lives. And, uh, I, I in fact, I have a theory that, that many men pick, it wasn't just female readers of the original romance comic books. I, I have a feeling that a lot of men picked them up, and they might have been telling the 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 newsstand owner that they were picking them up for their girlfriend or their sister or their mom. But I think uh, they, they a lot of guys were reading these comics for themselves, trying to figure out women and how this whole romance thing worked, and and dating, and you know, dealing with the your girlfriend's parents and your own and, and things like that, you know, and I think, uh, I think the, the, the readership of these comics were huge. There was hundreds of romance titles and just tons in, in, in a two or three year period in the fifties. Like that, that was like one out of every four comic books printed was a romance comic. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just a huge genre. And lasted for a pretty long time, and uh, you know, and I think had a lot of readers, male and female, young and old. I think people enjoyed these, and, and, and I mean, there weren't, you know, the, these predated soap operas. I, I guess there was probably soap operas on the radio mm-hmm. of sorts, but uh, stories. But as far as visual soap, soap operas, this was before. This, you know, I think this was before the soap operas on TV. Romance comic books, so they they served a need for people, and people enjoyed them. Uh, of course, we've chosen to to choose the ones that we can laugh at or along with. Yet, uh, you know, so, some of the stories also do are kind of poignant and kind of have a sweet spot to them too. Which uh, I don't know if we'll, I don't know if we'll cry like the girls in the romance comic books or in a. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein panel, a, a tear will come down our cheek. But uh, you know, I, 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 you know, they, they, some of the stories do kind of hit your soft spot, don't they? Well, yeah. And, and coming back to to the beautiful one, where that does have a very affirming message at the end, and I can see someone looking at that and championing the message. And I want to contrast that to a story that comes a little earlier in the collection, and that is "Too Fat for Love." Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, this is in some ways, or at least it starts off, or you think it's going to end, as an affirming, uh, to have an affirming ending. But then at the very end, you know, when she uh, holds away in her room and refuses to eat for several days, of course, as a result of that, she becomes thin. Right. And uh, and so, you know, what's the message there for, for female readers? Or male, male readers, for that matter, you know? Well, there, there was. It does seem like there was a lot of what people were popularly calling these days body shaming. There was, uh, it, I, 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 overweight seemed to be the the the, the most uh, prominent one. But there were stories about girls that were too skinny, girls that were too too fat, girls that were too tall, girls that were too short, and we're going to be including all those in uh, uh, future issues. Uh, it seems like whatever you are, if your hair is curly, then then you want your hair straight, and if your hair is straight, you want your hair curly. It seems like you know women never get a break in in often in life, and in these stories, they're always the the wrong size. In, in fact, 
apart from the stories in old romance comic books, there, there's the ads, which in, in some future uh, volume will probably print some of the best of the ads. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the same issue, you would find ads about uh, directed to girls who were too skinny, and then you turn the page, and there was uh, in in flat chested, and then you turn the page, and the, 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 there's an ad for the trying to ha- supposedly help uh, girls who were too too uh, too soft and round. So, uh, uh, you know, girls didn't get a didn't get a break in these stories. Though there, we do have, a, I can't remember if it's in this volume or not. Maybe you guys can tell me. Uh, maybe it's just a future issue of uh, of the floppy comic I, I work on. There, there are a, some stories where the where the characters, male and female, are overweight, and they it, they find each other and they they live happily ever after, and and they they don't shed a pound. Right. right. Well, that's good. that's good. Yeah. Another thing yeah. I, I wanted to, to comment on in, in, in I this. I've seen, uh, you know, every kind of story in these romance comic books. I'll find a new one that just, like, blows me away. Just something new and different and the crazy, wacky new angle that I have never never would have thought I'd, I'd see. Okay, well, well that, that brings up uh, another question I have is, and, and this is not only for what you do in Weird Love, but also Haunted Horror. Now, you know, I, I know you're a collector, and so you get a lot of stuff, and people show you or introduce you to to a lot of different comics. But h- what are the logistics of going through and finding these old romance or horror comics that you weren't aware of? I mean, do do you uh, do you go on eBay? Do you go to um, flea markets? I mean, how, how do you, how do you get the comics? to start sifting through them to determine which ones you may want to include in these f- future volumes. Well, starting out, I, 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 you know, I had just run across wacky romance comic books at, at conventions and in the dollar boxes and things like that. And, and started, you know, started as, and I started to see patterns. There were certain artists or certain publishers or certain years that seemed to, uh, are certain titles that seem to have the wackier things. And so then I would, it, it's hard with the romance because they're, they, the co- romance comic books haven't been documented as much as all the other genres. Certainly every, like, every panel is, an, has been analyzed in the superhero comics. Who, who drew them and who inked them and who, uh, e- erased the pencil lines, you know, they, they figured all that out. But, romance comic books is still a kind of an uncharted territory. There's, you know, the, the, there hasn't been, uh, uh, the detective work done on, on romance comic books in the, in the listings of all the stories and who the artists are that, that, that drew them and stuff like that. So it's kind of, it's, it's much more hit and miss, which it makes it harder, but in some ways has made it for me much more fun. I, I, like I said, I never know what I'm going to find. And uh, so just when I thought I've seen, seen the wackiest, uh, weirdest romance story out there, something else comes along that trumps it. Uh, so uh, so at the beginning, there was like just kind of uh, finding patterns and ordering sometimes blindly off uh, eBay. And like you say, finding uh, may, may, maybe buying big lots of comic of romance comics and and sifting through them and throwing away the ones that didn't have the weird stories and keeping the ones that did. And, uh, uh, but th- th- just, uh, last month I visited a, a dear friend who has a huge romance collection. And, uh, and I spent, uh, three or four days in his home and going through stacks and stacks and stacks of romance comic books. And he and, and, and another friend helped me, uh, do that. And we just, I, I found probably, Five years worth of uh, we love comics in his collection, so there's no shortage of weird love in the world. <laughs> no shortage of weird love. Yeah, you can quote me on that. So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, and people, do, and, and I have a couple people who are excited about weird love, and they're always sending me scans of stories, and hey, did you see this? Did you see that? And uh, a couple people sent me the uh, story we print, pr- recently printed about 
called Mo- Mo- I, I, I think it's called uh, I Love the Monster or something like that about this wacky guy who was played a monster on kids, uh, uh, host character on kids TV shows, a wacky monster. Uh, and this girl uh, refused to fall for him because she was just so embarrassed to be even be seen with this guy with her friends and stuff. Uh, but she, she, of course she eventually f- falls for the monster and realizes what a sweet guy he really is. Uh, so, uh, but a couple guys sent me scans of that story. That's close to the plot of, uh, the clown story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think again, uh, there must've been a lot of male readers because oftentimes the girl ends up with the, with the wacky out of source kind of character in, in the weird love stories. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing I want to know about the, this uh, first volume of Weird Love is you have uh, an, an introduction from Comic Book Girl 19, who has her own YouTube channel, uh, Comic Book Girl 19. And so I'm wondering when will Andy and I be writing an introduction to one of your future volumes? Well, th- thank you for the kind offer. Whenever you guys want to, <laughs> you guys aren't as uh, uh, cute as uh, Comic Book Girl Nineteen, but uh, I-, I think you would do do a very astute introduction. And Andy cleans up good. <laughs> That's good. Well, would he, would he be willing to dress like a clown and? Uh... <laughs> when wouldn't I? That's that's Thursday. <laughs> I'm sure our readers will have some clown love for him then. Well, yeah, yeah. Der- Derek's the clown fetishist, though. In the, uh, in the uh, uh, I, I, it's alternative universe. It's a, it's it, people. There's a lot of Derek. You're not alone. There's a lot of you out there. There's, <laughs> that's been uh, the story. People like the best clown love. They're, a, they're, dem- a, they're demanding more. It's a it's a fetish fear. <laughs> right. Well, there's a close there's a close fear and fetish and all that. It's very all close together, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, in, in in wrapping up, Craig, I want to get back to something that we talked with you about quite a bit the last time we had you on the show, or early in the year, and that is your five year anniversary. And the Yippie I.O. Society. So uh, how has your fifth anniversary year been going? Uh, fantastic. You know, we, we launched it with uh, sending out Yippie I.O. Society kits uh, to, to, to people like yourselves and in the media and, and some of our biggest supporters. And and uh, that that was a big hit. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it when I was a kid, I, I was a member of the MMMS, the Mary Marvel Marching Society. So I might have taken some inspiration uh, from that experience when we formed the Yippie Yo Society, the YYYS. And we, we have a, uh, a, a, a record that comes with a kit and a membership card and, and uh, a, a big shiny button that you can wear at conventions this summer. And so we, we had a lot of, and, and a video on YouTube, uh, uh, so if, if they search for the, uh, we have the YouTube uh, and, and one of our videos uh, on the YouTube on YouTube is, uh, the YOE t- tube is on, on YouTube it has, uh, the UPI Yo society video and a lot of other cool videos, uh, <laughs> around our different books. So people can check that out. And I think it's a lot of fun. So we're having a, gr- a great, uh, 50th anniversary year. We've got a lot of great books planned, uh, we're putting to get uh, to bed a, a book of Walt Kelly's fairy tales, uh, which is uh, uh, going to be a, maybe our most beautiful book ever. It's going to be uh, the, the I'm, we're really putting our heart and soul into the design and, and the printing with uh, with uh, uh, gold foil and red ribbons to mark the pages, and uh, the edges will be like a a, a gold uh, edged uh, Bible and. Quite a beautiful book, and we continue to put out collections of haunted horror and and more. There's going to be more weird love coming. <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, so, so, so we're, we're having a great time. We're, so we're, we're pretty, we're, we're a pretty fun five year old, I think. Yeah. So you got a lot to look forward to, uh, as we continue into this fifth year, uh, celebration. And, uh, and, and I'm sure if, uh, history, is any indication we will have you back on the show b- before the end of the year? Oh, great! Well, maybe we can record that down at, at Heroes Con. I'll be. Uh, I'm very excited to going about going to Heroes Con. I've never been, uh, but Shelton uh, uh, invited me this year, and I've heard it's a terrific convention. It's very comic uh, and artist centric, and, and it seems like uh, I'll, I'll be a terrific fit there. And then my other big convention uh, appearance that I'm equally excited about is the San Diego Comic Con has made me a, a special guest this year. So I'll, oh, uh, great. I'll you know, have special panels and and all the wonderful hoopla that that convention can afford. And and uh, you know, I, I I always have a lot of fun meeting my friends and fans of Yo's books out there. So it's going to be really nice to be. And, and, and quite an honor to be a special guest this time around. So, uh, you know, so if I, I hope to see maybe some of your listeners at these conventions or some of the others I might pop up at. And, and I hope they go to yo.com. Can I put in a plug for our, the, yeah. our books, webs, uh, the website for our books? It's y- Y-O-E, uh, books.com. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'd welcome visitors there. It's, it's beautiful this time of year. Yeah. And we'll, we'll put up a link in our show notes too. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And uh at at Heroes Con I can uh show you the booths I make a beeline to to get my cheap romance oh. comics and oh, uh uh a- I know you're a fan of ACG comics too, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I I usually pick up a load of both of those things at Heroes Con every year from a couple different dealers. Oh, good. Well, I'm always looking for cheap love, so <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'll find that with you. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Actually, you're, that not, be, you're not the first. <laughs> that could be the title of our introduction for your next volume of Weird Love if we write that. Oh, very good. Che- cheap, cheap love. <laughs> cheap love with the two guys, yeah. <laughs> so, that sounds uh, good to me. Well, Craig, uh, as always, thank you very much for being on uh, the as show. As my great pleasure. I'm, I'm, I am deeply honored by... Uh, my association with you guys and your wonderful podcast. And it's, it's great being a guest and, uh, and thank you for all your, uh, w- wonderful support. So we say if one's more to be sure that no books are the finest you can purchase. The reason that good is a mystery is that your books are Mythical Comics History. Well, a- as usual, we had a fun time talking about talking to Craig Yeo about his weird love and Milt Gross's New York. Yep, uh, it's always fun having him on the show. And as, as as I said in our interview, as much as he continues to put out, if we decide to have him on, even every other book or every third mm-hmm. book that he comes out with, he, he's going to be on the show a lot. Yeah. So, uh, again, we want to thank Craig Yo for being back on the podcast, and we look forward to not only having him back on for another regular interview, but also seeing him at, in a couple of months in Charlotte at Heroes Con. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to meet Craig in person. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we will definitely have to take a lot of pictures with him. Yep. Weird love and otherwise. So if you want to find out what the big to-do is on Yo! Books, well, you can get them if you want to pre-order them. Uh, go to the website of our sponsor. That's Discount Comic Book Service. So if you go to dcbservice.com, you'll be able to pre-order future issues of Weird Love, uh, Haunted Horror, and other Yo! Books. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you want a copy, for instance, of Weird Love, Volume 1, you know you want it. You can mm-hmm. go to the sister company of DCB Service, and that's In Stock Trades. Now, right now, I'm looking at the discounts you get on In Stock Trades, and you can get Weird Love at 30% off 
of the regular price. So instead of paying twenty nine ninety nine, you pay only twenty ninety nine. And it's a beautiful book. You can't go wrong. So whether you get your Yo books pre-ordered through Discount Comic Book Service or through In Stock Trades, it's the place to go. And after mm-hmm. you do get your Yo books there, then get in touch with us and tell us, Yo, how you doing? We want to hear from you. If you go to our website and you will find on the right part of your browser a send voicemail tab, click it and through the wonders of SpeakPipe, you can leave us a message from your computer or your portable device. It's just that simple. Or if you want to be difficult about it, pick up the phone and call us the old-fashioned way. The number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by... Email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed where we announce new content to the podcast as well as updates to our blog. You can check out our Twitter feed at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, on Tumblr, and on Instagram. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream the show through Stitcher. You can also find the podcast on TuneIn. And you can find every single one of the episodes we've ever done, as well as our growing list of reviews and comics-related commentary on the blog. And the website address is comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and... Let us know how we're doing. That's right. So we do like to hear from you. Get in touch. And until we hear from you, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.